So hello, everybody. This is the um, plenary rather than the panel meeting that we have today for social and economic vulnerabilities. When we first started organizing this conference, we had all sorts of themes that seemed pertinent. Um, and I thought that the one called reducing vulnerabilities held amazing promise. Um, I know this sounds terrible because vulnerabilities in general are the story of sadness and our current COVID-19 circumstances make them even sadder. So it seems ironic, um, perhaps poignant to say that I'm happy, so happy to introduce and host uh, first Eva Ilus, our speaker from Jerusalem and from France, um, who will talk about very particular vulnerabilities. I find it interesting, I, I say this as coming from philosophy, that someone who is from sociology formally is such a great philosopher. Uh, Eva Ilouz works in Israel and in France, as I said. She is directrice d'études at EHESS, that's how we call it. It's the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales, of course, in Paris. She also holds the Rose Isaac Chair at the Hebrew University um, in Jerusalem. She has been also president of Bezalel Academy of Art and Design in Jerusalem. She's won the Annalise Meyer International Award for Excellence in Research from the Humboldt Foundation, the Humboldt Foundation, the Emet Prize, which is the highest scientific distinction in Israel. And she's the author of a million books, maybe a little less than a million, but I keep coming across her books. She's a regular contributor to Haaretz, to Le Monde, to Die Zeit. Um, indeed, I think it was 2009 or 2010 that Die Zeit chose her as one of the 12 thinkers most likely to change the thought of tomorrow. I think tomorrow has come much faster than we thought. But as I said, she comes officially from sociology and conducts research in cultural studies and social and cultural anthropology, cultural sociology, feminist theory. Um, what the pithy way of saying this is that she works in the sociology of culture. And as she says, she's trying to understand the intersection of capitalism and emotions. So the central concept that we will hear from her about today is the home. Our title is Bitter and Sour, the meaning of home during a pandemic. Thank you, Eva, and we're anxious to hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anat. I regret not to have had the opportunity to meet you in Israel. Um, and I had to wait the pandemic to meet you in Zoom. So what I'm going to um, talk about today are not, uh, you know, thoughts that I have written extensively about. Uh, I think you sh we should view this more as some fresh thoughts uh, that I wrote to myself during the first uh, confinement in Israel, which put me, as uh, many of us, in a state of uh, stupor. The corona pandemic is more easily qualified as a natural disaster than a man-made evil. Yet everything in its management was so spectacularly interwoven with politics and the media that it became impossible to view it simply as an inevitable natural scourge. It exposed and undid the stitches with which most spheres of society were sewn. And those seamless stitches in many ways have come undone. And so what I'm going to try to think about with you is about one of those stitch, which is uh, the home. So I want to start by uh, with a book that dealt with a man-made, a very man-made evil, not a natural evil, which is Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, because Arendt tried to make sense of an event which produced a sense of stupor, which I think is also what many of us felt throughout the world for many months. A sense of, a sense of stupor in her case was uh, the pan-European massacre of the Jews. But what interests me here is not uh, the stupor, but the fact that she used a method of analysis which can be characterized as anti-historical in that she refused analogies from the past. 
The past, she thought, cannot shed light on the present or the future because, as Tocqueville put it, in times of crisis, the mind errs in obscurity. Epidemics and even pandemics have always, of course, accompanied humankind. And yet the corona pandemic will be, I think, a milestone, not for the scale of death it has caused. Indeed, it has caused, I think, um, a much uh, less death than many other plagues and diseases, but because of the ways in which we have organized it socially, economically, politically, and symbolically. So close to five billion people throughout the world have stopped, I um, mean, for many months or many weeks, stopped their mobility, work, and ordinary socializing willingly without much protest. Of, of course, I'm aware that there were protests in Germany or the United States, but by and large, the big picture is that there were not much protest. People were confined to their homes, assuming they had one, without the possibility of using streets, shops, or public transportations. That people would renounce their freedom willingly to defend their health is not in itself terribly surprising. After all, as Thomas Hobbes and others put it, we will always be willing to sacrifice a great deal of our freedom for our security. Fear of death is so powerful that people willingly accept the authority of a state who can save them, including surveillance measures uh, which suspend or uh, curb their basic civil rights. And this is especially true, I think, in light of the fact that modern states have become sanitary, what I would call sanitary states, that is states in which health uh, occupies an enormous uh, part of their legitimation and vocation. What is properly unprecedented here is was the form taken by the lack of freedom, which was a state of quasi house arrest on a planetary scale. This, I think, has had no precedent. Now, just you know, to draw a very quick comparison of other forms of crisis in times of war. The fear of death, of course, also exists, but we usually and normally confront it with other people. We know who the enemy is, or we think we know, and we can draw on a large symbolic repertoire of heroism to fight or hide. And yet, in the current, the, the current uh, crisis of uh, corona, we have been reduced to very small units, sometimes entirely isolated from the rest of the world. There was no clear action to take and very few sim known symbolic repertoires to draw from. Uh, just to remind you, the virus is also somewhat uh, unique or characteristic in comparison, say, to Ebola or the first SARS, in that 25% of the people who carry it are as asymptomatic, which means that anyone and everyone, including oneself, becomes an a priori source of danger. And so um, it's the fact that we don't see or, or know the danger in many ways that makes it so, um, and, and that it is uh, general. And this is in comparison to say to AIDS. I mean, it concerns all the areas of sociability and not as in AIDS, uh, mostly the area of sexuality. So all of these have made us riveted and confined to the home. And it is not only invisibility, but also difficulty of knowing what it is, it, whether we have it or not, that has curtailed much of our freedom and thus made us confined to our home. And so the home has done much of the work of providing the symbolic and material resources to keep them, um, to, to help them man, to help people manage the crisis. I want to ask the question here, if the home can do so much and what in fact we can learn about the home in this crisis. Home is famously sweet and uh, this uh, sweetness has become the place where we have um, engaged uh, with um, um, uh, we have engaged with the sanitary uh, crisis. Uh, 
So as we understand the notion of home as a private space where men and women, parents and children uh, interact as emotional par partners, this notion is a fairly recent cultural category. Medieval castles, for example, were less lived in than camped in as many people would gather in the great halls to eat, sleep, and entertain themselves. Neither privacy nor, of course, sanitation could be found in them, nor were they, of course, supposed to be the site of emotional intimacy and expressiveness between the members of the household. Some view the birth of the home in a Dutch 17th century, where domesticity occurred in more intimate settings, um, to provide comfort as being really the birth of the modern home. And we can think all of us of images of domesticity in the paintings of Vermeer or Franz Hals. Later on in the 18th, but mostly in the 19th century, the home became the privileged site for women, for the expression of sentiment, for what the historian John Demos called the hot house of emotions a place where warmth and emotional expressivity would nurture children and the spouses. Charles Swains, an 19th century English poet, characterized the home very uh, characteristically. He said, he wrote, homes not merely four score walls, though with pictures hung and gilded, home is where affections calls, filled with shrines the heart, the heart had builded. Now, of course, the separation between private and public spheres has not, was not new to the 19th century. In the classical Greek world, the female private and the male public spheres were both fundamentally distinct and in a relationship of hierarchy to each other. What was new, however, to the 19th and 20th century was what the home became invested with moral meanings and was devoid of any economic vocation. Women were in charge of the home and this space was not only opposed to work to the market to male selfishness, competitiveness and self-interest. It was also above all of them. The home had a morally elevated status. It became domestic, female, presumably withdrawn from the public sphere. And because of that, therefore, able to be the repository of the authentic self and morally superior to the falsity of the outward world. This is why the modern home became the place where ideals of authenticity and consumer ideals of comfort and intimacy all in one could be uh, formulated. So magazines such as Style at Home Decor, House and Garden, uh, Style at Home Kitchen and Bath, etc. cetera, um, um, you know, offered for ordinary middle and working classes ideals at one and the same time of material comfort and of uh, ideal relationships and family. Hannah Arendt, and I'm going to refer to in this paper all throughout to Hannah Arendt, opposed the romantic and even consumer view of the home as a haven from a heartless world. Building on Aristotle, she viewed private matters as pertaining to, ma to the material necessities of the household. For ancient Greeks, the home was where one accomplished the physical labor of sustaining the human body and of reproducing the human species. And thus the home was the place for women, children and slaves. Similarly, Arendt viewed the private sphere as entirely deprived of freedom it was not the site where one could deliberate and exercise reason and be free. Only citizens of the polis were free. And so if you want, um, it meant that the public sphere was the only place where one could uh, express its freedom. It's very counterintuitive and I think very different from how modern or contemporary people have increasingly come to understand the home precisely as a place where we can exercise our freedom to be whoever we want to be. Arendt was not a feminist and thought of power only as belonging to the public sphere, but her views of the home were not that far from that of the feminist who would later denounce home as a place of oppression and raw power 
as a place which was becoming increasingly also meaningless for women. If anything, the planetary corona confinement, I think it has been a huge experiment without equivalent in history to test Arendt's and the feminist view of the home, especially Arendt maybe. If we had been the subject of a huge experiment run by a giant and mad scientist, that scientist would have discovered that indeed the public sphere of sociability, of leisure, of the streets, of cafes is fundamental to the constitution of home and our identity in a way that was unknown and invisible to us, um, to us before, um, before we uh, entered this crisis. So let me say um, the ways in which I think um, the home is no longer, we can no longer subscribe to the myth or mythology of home I um, exposed before. For one, and perhaps most obvious, obviously, many homes, urban crowding and speculation and real estate speculation adding are too small and unequipped to give each member of the family the capacity to act and uh, live uh, continuously together as the highly individuated individuals which modern societies have turned us into. For example, bathrooms and kitchens are shared with others, sleeping uh, spaces are very close to each other. So here I refer really to the home as a concrete architectural fact, and I refer to the fact that after the 1950s, a great deal of the homes that were built were actually homes that uh, were, um, very, which had very little contact uh, with the street, uh, did not have balconies or terraces, and thus de facto created structures that were both isolated from the outside world and which created a kind of continuous contiguity in contact with others. And, um, and th this, of course, also is um, all the more relevant for the people who live in large, cheap apartment complexes, in slums, in suburban prefabricated and cheap uh, housing. Um, and, uh, one may add where, that for people living in cramped quarters, the lockdown has been extremely difficult and self-quarantine has proved to be virtually impossible. This situation has caused, in fact, affluent renters and buyers in big metropoles to change their patterns, uh, favoring, for example, larger apartments, uh, sometimes uh, preferring, now preferring increasingly the ground floors, which were usually the least preferable uh, apartments. And in Paris, there has been a massive exodus to the countryside and to small towns with a uh, an unprecedented number of uh, requests to buy houses outside of uh, Paris. Um, I would say all in addition that um, we can add to this, the fact that for many home is a borrowed notion in the sense that for many uh, who have a home or who live in a home, uh, they live in a home on um, mortgages and home constitutes, uh, has, is now constituting a very severe financial threat. Um, in, the, in the US, the number of mortgage payers who were more than 90 days late for their payment, more than doubled, for example, from May to June, and about 7% of all mortgages were in forbearance programs as of September uh, 11th. So that's uh, just my first remark. Second, families and home rest on the massive work of schools which sustain and assist the work of socialization and social reproduction. Many homes, even comfortable ones, cannot really be a substitute for schools as they found out. Parents around the world express their powerlessness and profound fatigue at the sustained and daily interactions with their children. The school is such a powerful structure sustaining the homes that in fact no serious renewal of the economy is possible without schools and preschools. But more 
there, there is a, a more crucial aspect, which is that transferring education to the home exacerbates inequality in education. Um, uh, because the students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds are even more disadvantaged at home than they are at school. This is evident, for example, um, in um, a report that was written by the OECD, which showed that only 34% of students in Indonesia have a computer to work on, while in Switzerland, Norway, and Austria, 95% of students have one. So, and this is true inside countries and in between countries. In the US, the percent of students who lack internet access or don't have a computer increases dramatically with a decrease of income. In households with an income of $100,000 or more, only five students don't have computer access and about 10% don't have internet access. In the lowest income bracket, that is $10,000 or less, 45% of students don't have access to a computer and nearly 30% don't have internet access. So these inequalities are correlated with race as well. Uh, close to 40% of Native Americans don't have internet or computer access, while white Americans and Asian Americans are much more likely to have access to uh, the internet. And among African Americans, almost 30% have no computer access. So this is to say, my second point, home very much intensifies educational inequalities. Three, the home is implicitly structured by the possibility for men and women to hold separate lives. That is on the possibility to have and to follow different paths during the day. Um, domestic violence, we know, has, uh, is thought to have increased by at least 20% during the COVID-19 lockdown. And experts say that this is an unsurprising as domestic violence is known to increase when families spend a greater amount of time together, such as during the holiday. Add to this the fact that men and women but also violent men have, many of them have lost their job or were uncertain about they would lose their job. And, uh, um, and this uh, became indeed um, um, reason or fodder for their violence. The record amount of violence against women during the epidemics is a reminder if we needed one, that the home is livable for many only if it relies on the presence of an outside world in which the two sexes can lead separate lives and from which they can de derive a sense of value. After the lockdown in Hubei was removed, re record numbers of people registered for divorces. They dif discovered that home was not the place to have marriages indeed. And this I think is likely to be true in Europe as well. Fourth uh, uh, characteristic of this is that, um, in fact, there was a, a report published by the Lean In organization and McKinsey Company. And in this uh, report, which surveyed more than 300 companies and 40,000 employees, um, it was found that it was mostly mothers who were doing more work at home during the lockdown than fathers but also that mothers were more than twice as likely as fathers to worry that their performance was being judged negatively because of their caregiving responsibilities. And indeed, as the researcher points out, working mothers, these working mothers were right to worry because the, um, um, uh, there is a great deal of research on biases which shows that um, uh, women who show their commitment to children are actually judged more negatively and less committed to their work uh, than men. And to quote them, social science research shows that bias gets amplified under conditions of ambiguity, such as working remotely, when it's harder to actually see what employees are contributing 
when visibility is limited, people are more likely to rely on stereotypes to fill in the gaps. Um, so, uh, in other words, I think that gender stereotyping is actually reinforced um, by the uh, uh, pandemic. And we also know, and this might be or related or not, that many more women found themselves unemployed than men. Finally, and this might be my last uh, and perhaps most important conceptual point, I would say that um, the architecture of modern homes today is heavily predicated on the assumption that people spend most of their times outside their home, of course at work, but also engaged in leisure activities. In France, in March 2020, there was a research done asking uh, the respondents to, to answer the question when the confinement, when the lockdown period will be over, which, uh, what would you uh, like to do? And um, the most frequent answer that they uh, received was going to the movies and after that, um, going to the restaurant. I'm sorry, first going to the restaurant, drinking a drink with friends, having a cafe in a cafe. Second, going to the cinema. And third was to do sports uh, freely. And another, and a, a newspaper, François, uh, asked a very similar question to French people. And 35% of the French who answered said that the first thing they would like to do was to go out with friends. So shallow understanding would be that we have become addicted to the hedonism and pleasures provided by the public sphere. But Hannah Arendt, again, would have a very different interpretation. Home is, for her, opposed to the realm of appearances. Um, and the realm of appearances is the public sphere. As philosoph philosopher Barbara Carnevale, commenting on Arendt, makes explicit, the realm of appearances is crucial to social life in general. It is at one and the same time an aesthetic realm, that is a realm where we appear to others through our dress, our haircut, our cosmetics, our bodily figure, and it is a social realm of interaction where we interact with others. And it is a realm in which we never have to the access to the deep interiority of others only to their outward existence. This is what Arendt meant by the realm of appearances. It's a realm of performance. The realm of sociability is anything but deep. It is made of various forms of civilities, formal etiquette, formal politeness, casual conversations, empty but necessary rituals, codified behavior, banter, flirtatiousness, observations that we make ourselves on people's behaviors and bodily appearance, Etc. Arendt elaborated on Heidegger's notion of ecstasis, and see, she suggested that human beings always exist outside themselves. That's what ecstasis means. And only through this outsidedness do they properly interact with the world at once through objects, through their self fashioning, through their, and through the senses. That's how you constitute an interaction. For Arendt, then, appearances are anything but pathological. They are, on the contrary, the very conditions of sociability itself. I just want to show you now a nice example of what I mean. I hope I'll be able to uh, share with you, to know how to share. Um, share screen. So where is this image? Hmm, just hold on. Can you see the image? Anat, can you see the image? Not yet. No. Have, you, have you done the share screen? And, um, I thought I did. I, I thought I did. No, you don't see it? Not yet. Okay, so how about this, Anat? I will send you the image and I'll go back. We'll go back to it. I'll show it. Is that okay if you can? Can you? Um... I'm waiting to get it. It should be here in a minute. Hold on. 
and I'll keep talking while you know the mail reaches you. It's it's just a very nice, I think, um, illustration of what I'm saying. Um, so it's we are going to see an image of um, a woman dressed in very fancy clothes. Actually, you know, uh, she has a, a long dress and she has uh, makeup um, to take out her garbage bin. And this become actually viral and uh, lots of Facebook pages actually start of people started posting pictures of themselves going out to bring a, a fully dressed and in cosmetics to bring out the garbage bin because this was the only thing they were allowed to do. Um, you did you get it? Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, so there were lots and lots of uh, pictures. Uh, of it. So this is an illustration, exactly an illustration of what Hannah Arendt means when she speaks about a realm of appearance which we are actually dispossessed of during uh, the uh, lockdown at home. As Arendt put it, to be alive means to be possessed by an urge toward self-display, which answers the fact of one's appearingness. Living things make their appearance like actors on a stage set for them. So for Arendt, then the difference between the world of objects and the world of human beings is, is the opposite of what we normally think. Objects can only be what they seem to be. While, so they're not, they're not, they don't belong to the realm of appearances. While we human beings can constantly change and modulate our appearance, which is for her, the essence of social life. We exist for others. And if, as the respondents, the French respondents suggests, the leisure sphere became so central to our identity, it is because it is a sphere where we can precisely play with our appearances. And this is what people felt they were missing so much. This is true also of the realm of work, by the way. The, the realm of work and production uh, has been very often thought of as alienating and uh, exploiting. This is true also to a certain extent, but that work also, but the sphere of work also structures and builds the self in many invisible ways. It gives a temporal structure to the day and to the week. It is a site of sociability with colleagues and strangers. It is a place where we care to be fashionable and elegant. For many members of the middle classes, it is the place where we exercise a sense of competence and skill. In other words, it has become for men and women the main site for the production of our symbolic value, of our value. So home cannot repair, can never repair the absence of a public world because the sphere of production and consumption have become the main ways in which we create value and self-value, socialize, and even forge intimacy. They are the conditions, in fact, for intimacy. Work is where we exercise our skills and derive a sense of purpose. Leisure is where we experience a pairingness, pleasure, play, and the possibility of seeing and being seen by others. Con lockdown thus has meant that we lost not only a public world, the realm of appearances, but the world itself, the world too poor. If anything, the lockdown shows us how much Jean-Jacques Rousseau was wrong. A, an intense intimacy and a state of perfect transparency with others as families and homes provide in the long run would be perfectly intolerable. Whereas for, for Rousseau, that was the, the model. The experience of the lockdown is not only the experience of losing freedom, but also the experience of losing the world itself. For Arendt, modernity at large is characterized by the loss of the world. Losing the world means to restrict or to eliminate the public sphere of action and speech, to privilege or focus only on the private world of introspection, on private pursuit of economic interest, 
and I would add on the home itself. And this is indeed what we have uh, very much experienced during these lockdowns. These lockdowns, what we experienced was an intensely constricted sense of homeness, which made us, many of us, homeless actually. We, it was bearable for some only because they could work or watch movies or interact with their friends through technologies that is transport the public world of uh, work and leisure inside the home. Many around me smugly claimed that they were having a blast at home, you know, teaching themselves astrophysics or piano lessons or whatnot, and that their routine was not or had not been interrupted, but they did not realize that the sweetness of their homes was made possible by um, a greedy technology which provides ever increasing public structures inside the home and by an activity which resembles that of the public world of work and leisure. The home then can assume its proper function only when it is a part of the world. In the Corona crisis, it is the world that we have lost, both as a space to inhabit in safety and as a space to socialize and interact with other human beings. And so with the, but I think that what this crisis has highlighted, and this is something that's worth thinking about when we think about what, uh, um, what the future has in store for us, it is the mythology of the home as a very sweet place that we should dispose of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, I am looking to see, okay, I, I have like a million questions, but I'm looking to see if anyone wants to uh, make a comment before we continue. Is there someone, um, support team, have you sent me anything? Not yet, I guess. Hold on. All right. So um, I don't know if it's proper to make this just a conversation between you and me, but there were so many exclamation marks that came up in my mind while you were speaking. Um, I'm not going to take pride of place. I'm, I'm going to first go to a question that we have here, and then I will butt in if I need to at some point. So this is from Milena Ponchio, Ponchio um, and she says, well, first of all, she thanks you for a brilliant lecture. So I have to say this, uh, it was brilliant or it is brilliant. And I guess if we have more questions like I do, then it makes it even more brilliant. But the question is phrased in this way, what is for you the main strategy to recover during the crisis, those symbolic values of the home, how to guarantee the right of having a home and reduce these socio-spatial inequalities. So this is, I guess, looking yeah. forward, but t take it wherever you want, Eva. You yes. know, I, to be completely honest, I have not thought about it and, uh, these um, very good and important questions um, should be thought about carefully. Uh, you know, we could imagine, we, we, could, we can imagine, um, for example, I, I think the rich should be taxed, uh, should have been taxed immediately. Should, there should have been an immediate transfer of money from very rich corporation to provide internet access you know, actually, it is the internet companies and computer companies which should have been responsible for providing computers and internet access. They should have, you know, if many countries had emergency laws, I cannot see for the hell of me why a law like that could not have been um, could not have been passed. Uh, a law enabling students who were unable to, you know, to, who do not have the infrastructure to attend uh, school remotely, at least to have access to that infrastructure. So that would have been for me a first thing um, to do, which is to obligate 
uh, companies, corporations, exactly which would have you know, to be looked at into. But in, in times of emergency, uh, I think big companies and corporations should pull their share of what they owe uh, the public. Um, so that would be, you know, from the top of my hat, uh, one response. And then you could imagine uh, uh, families creating, uh, trying to create, I mean, I don't know exactly how the sanitary conditions would work, but trying to create uh, cooperate, educational cooperatives, uh, you know, um, trying to pull their educational resources together and doing it together. Um, so that would be maybe a, a, another uh, direction. But again, you know, this is too, a too important question to be answered like this. I would have to think about it more carefully. Yes, and I also think that um, you, you, you're very correct in saying that it's not just important, but these are questions sometimes of policy, sometimes of ideology, sometimes of on the ground governance, sometimes much bigger long-term um, ideas. So um, that, that's part of my feeling concerning this, this um, crisis. The crisis is a many leveled crisis. And, um, and I always wonder if they, um, when we talk about, as you said before, conceptual aspects of the crisis, uh, how the conceptual fits in with what you might call the practical or even the political, uh, these different um, contexts in which we can ask. But I do see that people are asking um, questions that are down to earth. People do need to know what to do or we need to be able to think about what to do. Let me though go on to some other questions that I have here. One is interesting. I was writing to myself when you were saying this is one, two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, what were the differences? What were the different aspects that you were um, addressing? And someone here says, what do you understand will be the generational impact of the mentioned educational differences that rose during the pandemic? And I was thinking of that because we've been reading so much about uh, there's there's kindergarten kids, there's the Z generation, there's all sorts of different ways of looking at the generations that are dealing with this. And this question is taking you that way about the, just saying education maybe is not enough. Okay, what education? Which generation is really going to be fucked up? Excuse me for saying that, but I'm gonna have fucked up in the next question too. So meanwhile, what, are, <laughs> what, what is the generational impact? of these educational difficulties? Gosh, I, I wish I knew. Um, I think, you know, lots of young people who would have gone to college or to graduate school are not going to go. So that's a very obvious question, I mean, uh, uh, impact. Um, I think also that um, there, uh, there will be in, um, in high school, I mean, more people, I mean, the, the ones who come from weaker educational background failing, more likely to fail, uh, entrance exams to uh, schools or, or uh, end exams of schools like the baccalaureate. Um, so that, I mean, these are the very concrete impact I can uh, think of. Um, but I think, you know, this in the mind of the younger generation, they intertwine completely climate crisis and the coronavirus crisis. And I think that for, the, for many of us, the corona crisis is a kind of preview, as you have previews in movies, it's a kind of preview of what a crisis on a planetary scale and something in which our infrastructures collapse or seem to collapse, what it looks like. So for me, uh, of course, I'm aware of the differences between the two, but I think, uh, and not... Uh, surprisingly, I think in many places, the Greens have reinforced their status politically. I think that the one of the biggest impact, it's not a negative impact, uh, so maybe I don't answer your question, but one of the biggest impacts is it's going to reinforce tremendously um, the a, a kind of um, 
imagination of what the uh, a world that collapses onto itself may look like. Um, th that I think is really new. We never experienced something on a planetary scale. Uh, the green politics is a politics that takes place on a planetary scale for it to work. Um, and the responses have to be the same all over the world uh, in both cases. So I think this is a generation which will uh, be much, much less compromising on, um, on ecology because it has had a kind of pretaste and preview of what this may look like, despite the obvious differences between the two. Right. Um, thank you. I go on to a question. This comes out of this, but goes a different way a bit. Um, this is from Stephen Advocate. Would you agree that there has been over many decades a general shrinkage of the social space with families ever more separated from each other, leading to a kind of involution, a kind of psychosocial incest that leads to reinforcement of negative traits? And he says, remember the Larkin poem, they fuck you up. That was my association for before. <laughs> um. I think absolutely. I think this is precisely because of this uh, social tendency, which you know, sociologists like uh, Putnam, Robert Putnam at Harvard, but he's not the only one. I mean, Putnam just opened up a whole uh, direction uh, of studies, and um, his colleague uh, in the sociology department, uh, Teda Scotchball, also found something uh, similar, and many people found something similar. Of course, you are entirely right. And in a way, this was uh, riding, if you want, on these uh, uh, research and this tendency. And it's, uh, I, you know, it's not original to say that the or Corona crisis has accelerated some tendencies. So I think it, it both has, a, for example, the hold and the grip which uh, Netflix or Amazon uh, or Google have on our lives. So that became very obvious. What we so we think of the economic aspects of that grip. We don't think enough, I think, of what it means to transfer social life at home. And um, so this is exactly what I was uh, trying to figure out. And uh, the tendency towards um, the increasing fragmentation, which has been happening since uh, the 1970s, if you follow Putnam. Um, in which he attributes to television. But I mean, if you compare television, which for Putnam was responsible for the collapse of many associative forms, um, but television was a hyper communal way of interacting when you think of it, because at least when you had television, people would gather together, the family would gather together around something, even if it's a sc screen. Uh, whereas now if everyone has his own in the family, everyone has his own screen. So you see an in, a, see, you see a clear tendency towards an increasing individualization of the fragmentation. So even inside the family, that fr fragmentation takes place, uh, in fact. And I just want to remind, I mean, that Adorno or Keimer, Hannah Arendt, who came out of... Um, a very brutal era of fascism when they thought about it and they thought about the conditions for the renewal of fascism. Certainly in Hannah Arendt, we see this idea that for fascism to emerge, what you need is a society of fragmented people because it is this fragmentation that disables uh, politics and the political realm. Um, so, um, this is also what this paper is about. It's, it's also connected to that tradition of thinking. So, so this is almost a follow-up on that. This is from Arthur Louise Loureiro, I think, um, saying philosophically, the home plays a central role in shaping the identity of all human beings, but historically the role is exercised amid the intertwining of the family space with the other social spheres that make up the public sphere. How might this have affected the possibility of knowing people's needs and vulnerabilities in the context of a pandemic? 
with a view, of course, to implementing public policies. But how does that interaction play in, in the context of a pandemic in particular? The interaction between the home and public spheres? Yeah, I mean, that sphere, that, that space and, and other social spheres. Well, I think, I mean, the whole point of the paper was to say that in fact, what we call the home normally is actually made possible by an, by an enormous amount of outside organizations and institutions, public organizations and institutions, which make it possible. That was really my point, is that you can't understand at all the, this private sphere, this, uh, you know, this bubble, without actually understanding the ways in which it is supported by an, an enormous amount of invisible structures. Supported both concretely, but also symbolically. I think, uh, you know, uh, what I was trying to say is that, for example, in a marriage or a family, what makes the interaction possible is precisely the fact that people leave their homes and then meet again. And that this, this structure, which was not always, by the way, always the case, but modern homes, which are very small and have lost any and all economic vocation, uh, modern homes have this structure. And so um, the lockdowns um, highlighted the ways in which these homes become intolerable if they become purely private structures. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Now, we know also that women and children who were battered, who were victims of violence, had no access to uh, social workers. Uh, and that, um, I mean, that a lot of the public services could not actually get to, to the private homes. So there was a real a sense of uh, a rupture. I think maybe in the second lockdown, perhaps these things are better handled, but during the first lockdown, it was uh, the, the, the sense of uh, complete separation between the two was, uh, um, was very painful. Um, I've got two questions here that, uh, that are somewhat connected, and then maybe I'll finally get to mine, and if not, I'll ask you after we're finished. Um, one is from Gabriel Amitsis, who says, first of all, congratulations for the lecture. Could you comment on the conflicts between the human need to live in a decent home and the risks to be evicted from your home due to indebtedness during the pandemic? And another person asks, um, Amanda Salgado, um, do you believe the current crisis of the right to adequate housing is a reflection of the 2008 crisis, the financial, the big financial crisis uh, in, the, in the world? Um, uh, so here we've got the risks to be evicted and the, the crisis in 2008 when people lost their homes as well. Um, wh what could you I comment mean, on that connection? I don't have a very uh, intelligent answer to give. I, I, I was struck by the difference of policies in Israel and France, where in Israel, uh, the news for a while were filled, the, the, the evening news were filled with images of people evicted from their homes because they defaulted on their rent. And the, um, um, and the owner of the apartment just could, you know, just evict them just like that, and, you know, uh, followed the normal procedure. Uh, in France, there was a suspension of, uh, you know, of the possibility of any owner to engage in a procedure to evict uh, renters in the case that the renter had been, uh, um, you know, was unemployed because of the crisis. So, so in a way, what I want to say is that for me, this, I was struck by this because this issue of how the state responded to people defaulting on their mortgages for me uh, was in a way deeply reflective of how deep, of how, um, how much the state was committed to its citizens or whether it was committed to, you know, a Lockean view of private property as having the, um, um, as, as, be, as having uh, precedence 
over the vulnerability of people who could no longer pay on the, their rent. So that's a, a remark I made to myself. Um, what was, I'm sorry, there was a second question I forgot. No, they both had to do with, with debt, with, uh, with uh, loans. Oh, and the 2008. Yeah, thing from 2008, yes. Yeah, I mean, Thomas Poggi will answer this much better than me. Um, I, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it is. I think the, um, um, I think, I mean, there is, of course, a similarity in, there is a similarity in the two crises, at least in the United States, in that it seems that the uh, ways in which um, it was handled was by uh, helping or salvaging the rich um, and, and the, the and, and that, you know, contrary from what I understand, you know, in the New Deal, there were lots of uh, things that were done in which the uh, um, it trickled down throughout all of society. Whereas in 2008, a lot of the help went to salvage the big companies like AIG, uh, presumably because it would save the international finance system. I have no idea. Um, so I think there are, uh, and I think that the, um, um, the, the European response was different from the American response in, in the sense that the European response is really trying to figure out how to have more of a, 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 a to provide a help that would more trickle down to the to society as opposed to helping just the very big uh, actors. So that's what I would say um, from the top of my head. So that's that's interesting. The, the reason I, I still go on with this question um, is something that you said at the beginning of your answer, and that's the difference between Israel and France. But what I've been constantly thinking about is the difference between different places. Um, it's even the United States. Eviction, for instance, uh, was made impossible, at least at the beginning, uh, as opposed to uh, as what you just said now about Israel. And, and I remember your article, I think your article in Haaretz, it must have been in March or April, I think it was one of the first articles where someone was trying to figure this out politically and conceptually. You were talking about the relationship between the individual and the state. Like where, where is the state? How do, we, how do we conceive of the state's responsibilities in this type of crisis? But when I think of these differences, I would love to ask you, and I know we don't have time to think about it, but I would love to ask you about difference, about your idea of the home, which is still a very westernized idea about public and private, Arendt is still westernized. And when I read about what happened in China, when I've talked to friends from Singapore, from places that are very, they're, they are um, capitalist in a way, but they are very different culturally. I'm not sure that the concept of home even answers to our mantras of home sweet home or whatever, any, anything like that. So I'd love to just continue doing that kind of research. I guess that's what anthropologists do, but definitely not philosophers. But I am going to go to a final question, um, which takes us, brings us back down to earth and um, someone saying, I really think from the heart, um, nice analysis, but what's the way forward for students in developing countries who can't even afford a smartphone? What can we do if we're to avoid the education inequality? And, and you talked about, of course, um, different groups going to college or not going to college, having internet access or not even having internet access. But this type of question, what can we do? Do you think in that way when you're talking about these things? What can we do? What can we do to what? I would need a not a very specific question. Um, well, yeah, so in this question, there, I, I guess the question is about the education inequality. Um, what can we do? I, can, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is not, again, for policymakers, uh, for ideological thinkers. Uh, you know, I think that, first of all, highlighting 
the tremendous inequalities and yeah. saying that this type of crisis, because at the beginning, you know, there was a slogan saying uh, we are all equal in front of the virus. I don't know if you remember, there was for many weeks, we heard that all the time, we're all equals and uh, each one of us can uh, be sick to the same extent. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I, th and I, I think that al already, I mean, so, you know, I, can, I could hear in your question an implicit opposition between the real world and, uh, and the kind of analysis I do, but, you know, you, First of all, you need to to, cons to clarify what is happening, and I think um, clarifying and providing concepts and opposing uh, a myth such as the one we had at the very beginning, such as we were all equals in front of the disease, and very quickly it stopped when we knew that uh, many more working class people and uh, African American people were dying. Uh, um, so that so so for me. Um, the role of academics is a very important one, no less than that of policymakers, which is to clarify the terms of the debate and to bring up issues that may not be uh, visible. So exactly what should be done, you know, I have no idea because I don't have data and I, I, I cannot be serious. Uh, I would not be taken seriously if I told you from the top of my head what should be done. But I think that to do what I do, with many others has value for changing the world, which is to clarify the concepts we have to grasp the world. I don't think we can change it without the adequate concepts. Thank you. I think that's a good place to stop. Um, Michal Apollo, I see you there. It's nice to see you. Um, and I will put your question off for later, maybe if we have time, we'll go back to it because it's a question I've had often. Um, but I, I love the fact that, that Eva, you think that there's something for academics to do. <laughs> not only something for academics to do, but something for academics to do, which is not necessarily go marching in the streets or as I usually call it in Israel, climb over the hillsides, but rather not, not only with our feet, but to do something which, ha which demands our conceptual engagement. Uh, so I thank you very much, Eva.